Last night, I was going to bed, just checking Twitter like many of you do, and I see Marty Smith's tweet of a statement in which NASCAR needs to apologize and also tell you what they're going to do after finding a noose in the garage star stall of the number 43 car. That is Bubba Wallace's car. Bubba Wallace is the only top tier black NASCAR driver on the circuit. This was at Talladega, which was postponed during, due to rain. It's going to run today. The statement reads, late this afternoon, NASCAR was made aware that a noose was found in the garage stall of the number 43 team. We are angry and outraged and cannot state strongly enough how seriously we take this heinous act. We have launched an immediate investigation and will do everything we can do to identify the person or persons responsible and eliminate them from the sport. As we have stated unequivocally, there is no place for racism in NASCAR, and this act only strengthens our resolve to make the sport open and welcoming to all. Now, last, well, two weeks ago, I was talking about the Confederate flag, I was talking about Bubba Wallace, I was talking about NASCAR taking a stand against racism and what that flag represents to so many. Last Friday, the NCAA and the SEC took it a step further going, we will not allow competition to be held in the state of Mississippi while the Confederate flag is still a part of the state of Mississippi's flag. I grew up in Mississippi. My grandmother is from Mississippi. Spent the first seven years of my life there in Hattiesburg. And each time that flag has gone up for a road of removal, the minority people tell me about shows up as a majority in the polls to very much keep it there. I've been asked many times over, what is it that white folks can do in the first Black History Month of my life where it feels like we're actually talking about black history and folks are figuring out how much fun it ain't. And I have said things like protect and love and listen, but I'll take it a step farther. I will take it to Earl Campbell, came out of Tyler, Texas, and for many is the greatest Texas high school football player of all time and the greatest University of Texas Longhorn of all time. But he probably never gets seen by Daryl Royal or recruited out of Tyler, Texas, if it weren't for William Wayne Justice. Tyler is remarkably racist in its past. And Earl would be the first person to tell you he ain't the most talented of his siblings. As a matter of fact, he's probably the fourth most talented person of his siblings, birth from Ann Campbell. But he had the benefit of playing at an integrated high school, but just barely. All due to William Wayne Justice, who was a white man. He grew up in the 1920s in Athens, a farming town. Five miles west of Tyler, steeped in law. Learn this, reading a biography of all people about Earl Campbell that was written by Asher Price. Now, Wayne Justice's father was politically connected in East Texas. He was attorney. He was a friend of future Senator Ralph Yarbrough and added his son's name to the office stationery when he was just seven because that's what he was going to do when he grew up. Now, William Wayne Justice grew up not unlike many white folks that I know, which is to, they have a story in their past about watching the black boy be racistly maligned. And it changes them for good or for better. In Justice's case, it was the mother of a playmate who told her child she couldn't play with any N-words. That stuck with justice. He became a U.S. attorney and later received a judgeship. And that judgeship totally changed the course of history in Tyler, Texas, because at the time it was a lifetime appointment from Lyndon Baines Johnson. And as Yarborough put it, God dang, when he got to that bench with a lifetime appointment, he turned into a tiger. 
But some of the cases this man had to rule on are just nonsensical, farcical, and would be funny if they weren't so terrified. Like, by the time desegregation was becoming a part of this United States in 1954, East Texas is going on like, no, it's 1953 here. We will continue to be segregated. We will continue to have a black school and a white school, and there will be no mingling, except for when the maid needs to cross the threshold to come clean a white person's house. Now, he integrated not just the cheerleading squads, but also took it a step further in his championing of black students and them having the rights granted to them by this constitution. Tyler had a high school called Robert E. Lee High School, named for, yes, the Confederate general. And the school was attended by rich and middle-class white kids, and they sported a real Confederate streak. At the school's football games, the marching band wore Confederate uniforms. The drill team was called the Rebelettes, and the football team stormed onto the field beneath a giant Confederate flag as wide as the goalpost. This was a grave concern to many in the black community because it burned them up and it burned their hearts that this place would stand so fiercely behind the Confederacy, a place that seceded from the United States in an act of war to continue to hold black folks as slaves. This is one of the times in which William Wayne Justice finally got a case before him in which black cheerleaders who wanted to be rebelettes filed suit and it got to him. And in it getting to him, he's able to change the course of history. By December 1971, citing Justice's order, the school's symbols no longer were meant to discriminate or upset racial harmony and they had to get rid of the Confederate symbols or lose $800,000 in state funding because that's what it had to take. He said, there's a difference between being proud of your Southern heritage and being racist. This man, for his troubles, was not just maligned. He was called the Antichrist. He <laughs> was chased while jogging. The stylist in town refused to do his wife's hair. He was sent death threats and he was made into the scapegoat for so many of Tyler's troubles, as it were, because he decided, no, I have an opportunity to do something that is worthwhile and right. And if he hadn't had that opportunity and if he hadn't done what was worthwhile and right, there is no Earl Campbell to talk about, not in that way. And we know that because of his siblings. Because the Campbells went unrecruited because who came to the black schools? Which were poor, which were run down. In many ways, integration took away jobs and also took away schools, took away our heritage. We were assimilating into another school and another school district that did not value us or value our traditions or value what makes us so proud, makes us Americans. Earl Campbell is one of the greatest ever. We got an opportunity because he's doing what I implore so many white folks to do now. Loudly shout down a noose in the number 43 stall. Loudly shout down images of the Confederate flag. And when you have an opportunity to stand behind what is right and risk your own wealth and risk your own livelihood to create a, poor, a more perfect union, I don't think you have a choice anymore. This time right now is going to define us as these times before have defined us.